We're in our 13th lesson in our study of the letter to the Colossians. In our letter, Paul today is going to give us some handles on what it means to live the resurrection life. You know, in gratitude for God's saving grace that He's lavished upon you, when you acknowledge that you are living a dead-end way of life, relationships messed up, chasing after happiness that doesn't satisfy, and then you believe the good news of the gospel that Jesus would change your life, and you made that commitment to Jesus to be His disciple, then you ask God to accept your faith in gratitude. There is a new way that you are to live your life. Now everyone who asks God to save them, having acknowledged the need and believed that Jesus can meet that need and committed to following Jesus, are expected to live the resurrection life. Let's see what that entails today as Paul teaches us. If you never ask God, first of all, to save you, ask God to reveal to you truth, okay? Just ask God to reveal to you truth. And when He does, there will be only one response, and you will know what to do in your heart. You will know how to respond. If you decide that everything you need is to be found in God, could you let me know? Would you let me know? Because I want to welcome you into the kingdom and that will never end. And I want to help you on your journey incredible spiritual journey. Now for those who call themselves Christians, those living the resurrection life, Paul writes this in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. And that means killing off everything connected with that way of death. Sexual promiscuity, impurity, lust, doing whatever you feel like it, whenever you feel like it, and grabbing whatever attracts your fancy. That's a life shaped by things and feelings instead of by God. It's because of this kind of thing that God's about to explode with anger. Now, it wasn't long ago that you were doing all that stuff and not knowing any better, but you know better now, so make sure it's all gone for good. The bad temper, the irritability, the meanness, the profanity, the dirty talk. Verse 9, don't lie to one another. You're done with that old life. It's like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes that you've stripped off and put in the fire. The resurrection life makes you God's ambassador. And as an ambassador of the kingdom of God to this world, there's a code of conduct. There are ethical demands that you agree to adhere to when you bent your knee to the Savior of your life. Now, as we already know, the Gnostics taught that once you were saved... It doesn't matter what you do with your body, what you do in the material world. I mean, if you have the secret knowledge, your spiritual eternity is set. The Judaizers taught that, you know, you perform, perform these rituals and keep this law, you'll be saved. It doesn't matter what kind of person you are on the inside. Just go through these motions. But Paul teaches that what you do matters. What you do matters. Who you are manifests in the things that you do. Now, most likely we're going to step on some cultural toes. Um, if you get stepped on, if the Holy Spirit shines a light on some error in your behavior, receive it as an invitation to change. Okay? Misbehavior doesn't make you a bad person, but rationalizing the behavior, blaming it on others, refusing to change, what that does is destroys your testimony and can eventually disqualify you from the benefits of being a child of God. And of course, there is a whole host of negative consequences that act as warnings from God that you might be on the wrong path. The misbehaviors that Paul highlights include sexual promiscuity, impurity, lust, bad temper, irritability, meanness, profanity, dirty talk, and lying. Now there are a bunch more behaviors that are inconsistent with discipleship that can be summarized as doing whatever you like. Doing whatever you feel like. Now it's probably not too far-fetched to assume that this list that Paul has given us were some of the behaviors that was occurring within that congregation. So let's consider what these things are and then how you go about killing them off. First of all, sexual promiscuity, which really refers to sexual intercourse and all of that outside the ordinate bounds of marriage. 
Okay, a few things are more controversial than your sexual behavior in the eyes of God in today's culture. But the resurrection life is a call to fidelity. It talks about impurity, virtues, and vices that are mixed in one's thoughts and deeds. The Apostle James asks this question. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? And of course the answer is no. The resurrection life is a call to purity. Lust, consumed by desire, most often sexual in nature, but one can lust for, for just about anything. And you are determined to obtain it no matter what. All, almost synonymous with lust is coveting. To covet something means to crave something so much that you are compelled to take it for yourself. Well, the resurrection life is a life of contentment. Bad temper. Persistent anger. A short fuse, like a volcano, suddenly explodes. But the resurrection life is a call to be slow to anger. Irritability. Not taking things in stride, always being annoyed, holding on to grievances. The resurrection life is a life of long-suffering. Meanness. That's being spiteful, cruel, unkind in attitude and action. Well, the resurrection life is a call to being kind. Profanity. We, uh, it, it, it means making, in the original language, it means making the sacred secular. Call, calling what is good evil. Being disrespectful. That's what the word means. P profanity is the attempt to use God to get what you want. And the resurrection life is a call to be a giver of blessings. Dirty talk. I mean, that, that's pretty obvious. Speaking of synodies, vulgar words, one, one of the sad situations of our day is that people are so habituated to using foul language that they don't even realize they are. I was uh, sitting there having a lunch, and uh, you couldn't help but hear a group of people talking, and my goodness, every third word was some type of expletive. Uh -huh, just the way we talk. The resurrection life is a call to speaking the truth in love. And right along with that, Paul identifies lying. That's hiding the truth. It's a lack of integrity. It's a lack of honesty. And you know what? If it's not true, if it's not necessary, or it's not kind, don't say it. Don't say it. See, the resurrection life is a call to trustworthiness. And then Paul writes, It wasn't so long ago that you were doing all that stuff not knowing any better. We we're all guilty of it. Paul urges us to kill the old ways. The old ways are all consistent with egoism's insatiable hunger for self-gratification. And the world offers happiness to you in every way imaginable. Hey, you know what? If you win the lottery, you'll be happy. You know, if you marry the right person, you'll be happy. If you drive the right car, you'll be happy. And on and on and on the promises go. Hey, this salary will make you happy. It really will. This address and living in this house will make you happy. Shopping here will make you happy. Please. Happiness is an inside job. You can't find it in the externals. But happiness is what the world promises. But my friends, it's an empty promise that leaves you empty. I mean, you get that dopamine high and it feels great, but the newness, the novelty, it quickly wears off. And the happiness that you thought would carry you, it just deserts you. Now, the way you kill off the old ways involves identification and replacement and a whole lot of Holy Spirit empowerment and time and hard work. Now, identification is just naming the old way that has to be killed off. I mean, you got to know what you're fighting against, right? You need to confess it to yourself, and then you need to confess to God how this old way has become a stumbling block to you. And you need to be very specific. I mean, just don't be general. Oh, Lord, forgive me for my sins. What is this thing that is a stumbling block to you? Bring it out. Confess it. And once you have specified the old way, 
What it is needs to become pray for deliverance. Now, I have heard testimonies, glorious testimonies of instantaneous deliverance. I mean, God takes away the habit, takes away the attachment, takes away the addiction, and even the desire in a moment. And it is glorious. So I tell you, pray for deliverance. And in my own life, I have not been so blessed. The old ways seem to die hard for me. So I'll tell you that along with prayers for deliverance and prayers for forgiveness and prayers for the power to overcome the old way, self-denial is required to continually say no to the old way. And sometimes, continually to say no requires a spiritual competent in your life. Someone who will lovingly hold you accountable to what you want to get rid of out of your life. Someone who will pray for you and encourage you. It's kind of like what an AA sponsor does for a person seeking to overcome alcoholism. They make themselves available to that individual so that when times of temptation become so great, they have someone to call, they have an outlet, they have a way to let off the pressure cooker steam inside them. So you may need that spiritual friend. You may even need something more public in your pursuit of deliverance. And that's by becoming an active member of a support group. Celebrate Recovery is a program that offers that kind of support for you if, if you'd like to. It, it, it's a great environment. And the one I'm, I, I know about um, is the one that Mike Pratt kind of oversees right now. He has got a good one. It's sponsored by Seacoast Grace in Cyprus. And and he will he'll welcome you and, and you'll it, it's just it's how to say it there, there's no pressure there's just that desire to change and that's welcome and everybody there is seeking deliverance so to kill an old way off that's inconsistent with discipleship you need to identify the issue you pray for deliverance. You may have to do the hard work of self-denial and accountability and give yourself time. I mean, yeah, deliverance can happen in a moment, but then again, getting free can take a lot of time. It can be a war with a battle after battle. So, so don't put a time limit expectation on killing off this old way. Just keep working the plan. You screwed it up? Keep working the plan. You fell off the wagon? Get back on the wagon. Keep on working the plan. Now, one additional thing you're going to need to do. When you kill off an old way, it creates a vacuum in your life. And nature just loves to fill a vacuum. So best you fill it with something positive you most likely will need to replace a behavior that when you're tempted by the old way, you go to the new way instead. Maybe you replace being overly stressed with uh, some kind of exercise. Maybe you replace entertaining yourself with porn by picking up your Bible and reading Scripture. Maybe you work too much, too many hours of the job, so you replace those excessive hours with a hobby. Trade a shopping problem with a service venture trade, replacing gossip with prayer, too much streaming, TikTok, Instagram, watching sports, then why not replace that time with the practice of one of the seven habits of a disciple? Fill the vacuum. Fill the vacuum left behind by the dead old way with a new life-giving way. Get in step and stay in step with the Spirit. He will lead you. Galatians 5, 16, live freely, animated and motivated by God's Spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. The old ways, doing whatever you feel like doing whenever you feel like doing it. And grabbing whatever tracks your fancy, Paul likens it to a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes that you've stripped off and put in the fire. Now, Suppose you're moving from an old house to a new one across the country. <coughs> Movers are charging $8 a pound to cart your stuff. And as you're packing up, you find a closet in your basement. And you open it, maybe in a, an eclipse of moths escape from the confines of that closet when you open the creaking door. 
And because it's kind of dark and damp in the basement, you can kind of smell a little bit of mold, a little mildew emanating from your old clothes. Your old clothes. Yeah. Are they riding in the hair? Wow, you look in there and you recognize Gucci and Prada and Armani. You got apparel from Bloomingdale's and Saks. Hey, you know what? You really loved that stuff back in the day. You were the height of fashion. And now these are kind of out of style. They're kind of rotting on the hangers. What are you going to do with them? Oh, let's pack it and move it with us across country. Yeah. Hey, do you have a, a spiritual basement closet? A dark place where filthy spiritual rags of double-mindedness and half-heartedness or secret billion are, are hanging? They're molding away in your soul. Is there some kind of moral corruption uh, like the things that Paul has written about sexual promiscuity, impurity, lust, bad temper, irritability, meanness, profanity, dirty talk, lying? Is that in there? Is, is part of your soul mildewing with guilt or shame or regret or unforgiveness or self-rejection? What are you going to do with them? Are you going to pack them up and carry them into your new way of life? My friends, because of the atonement Jesus made for you, every sin can be forgiven. And what you do is you drag it out of the darkness into the light through confession. You kill it through repentance and sometimes through restitution. Often you need to confess to a spiritual mentor to hold you accountable for a change, but also to hear from another human being that you are forgiven. And you take it and you throw it in the fire, into the waste bin. You don't even take it to goodwill. You just burn it. And in this you'll find healing. And in the healing, find freedom. <coughs> okay, so in this teaching, we've examined some of the typical human vices that are inconsistent with following Jesus. These vices are rags of the old way of life that you wore at one time, that I wore at one time. But once you've accepted, when once God has accepted your faith, you have the power to take off the old ways, burn them, get rid of them forever, and now you can put on the virtues of Christ. This is your new clothes, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. You get to wear those things. You get dressed, my friends from the inside out. What we're talking about is a change of heart. And when that change happens, when you appear in public, people will see your style. And your style is patient and kind. There's not a stitch of jealousy or boasting or pride or rudeness. There's respect for others, forgiving others, being congenial to others. And that always makes you fashionable. You're tailored new clothes. They don't demand others to do what you want. But still, they'll stand up for justice and truth. Wherever you go, you're always going to be chic. No matter where you go. So take this to heart, will you? Once you've bent your knee to God, there is work to be done. In the moment when your faith became life, God declared you to be righteous. In the courts of heaven, you were identified as one of His own. In all the masses of humanity, He looks down and says, This one is mine. Righteousness means being rightly related, like Jesus is rightly related to the one He called the Father. And you were declared righteous. You are declared holy. And that declaration makes it true of you. And with that declaration comes the power to become the person that you have been declared to be. Legally you're made right. Morally, the work has begun. You partner with the Holy Spirit to be the person God declared you to be. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, 
And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Now we have a name for this partnership of empowerment, of this empowerment to change. It's called sanctifying grace. So there's a grace gift that declares us to be righteous, and there's a grace gift that empowers us to grow deep, to grow up, to grow fruit, to become like Jesus. If you're not changing, if you're not growing, if you're not becoming more like Jesus, you need to ask yourself, why am I not? Why am I still here? Why am I still stagnant? Why am I still dealing with these old ways? And so that's where you need to start. Yeah, start your inquiry with, with the old ways of doing life that you have dragged into that new life with Christ. Find what that old way is and kill it. And replace that old rag with something that keeps you in step with the Holy Spirit. Because friends, let me tell you this. Love looks good on you. Looks good on you. 